Our scripture this morning comes from Colossians, the third chapter, and it's the 17th and the 23rd verse. And it reads, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And verse 23, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not human masters. So our topic today is finding real joy in living. You know, one of the things that we all desire and search for is the joy that the scripture talks about. Jesus always talks about in the scripture, he talks about making our joy complete. And we know the first step to making our joy complete is accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But when we become a Christian, our position changes. We become citizens of heaven. The world is not our home, and we know where we'll spend eternity. Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. And I go away to prepare a place that, so that where I am, you may be also. So our citizenship changes. And our practices also change because our lives become filled with purpose. And that purpose adds earthly responsibility. And that's where life becomes a challenge. We're earthly beings with, earth, with earthly responsibilities, but we're supposed to be heaven-minded. The scripture says we can't serve two masters. It says if we do, we'll either hate one and love the other, or we'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And this just creates a little bit of conflict in the life of a believer, and that conflict creates some turmoil, because we have to make a choice. If we serve the things of this world, we do things that displease God. And we displease God when we try to reserve a part of our lives so that we can continue to live the same way we did before we were saved. And that constant tension causes us to lose our joy because we're always compromising. Every earthly victory comes with a spiritual defeat. Let me give you an example. When David, King David, walked out on his balcony and he saw Bathsheba across, across the way, on her balcony, what he should have done was turn around and go back inside. <laughs> but he didn't. He sent for Bathsheba, even though he knew that she belonged to someone else. Someone else. And he ended up creating a situation where her husband Uriah was killed. In fact, he had him murdered. So in the end, there was a victory for him in that he did get Bathsheba. But the question becomes, at what cost? He compromised his witness with God. And while he may have rejoiced in the beginning, it was tempered by the remorse for what, what he had done when Samuel came and asked, what have you done? And David and Bathsheba were blessed with a son, Solomon, but it was flavored with sadness that God allowed their first child to die. And David brought calamity on his household and dysfunction among his children for all the days of his life. So yes, David scored an earthly victory, but he, and he ended up with Bathsheba as his, as his wife, but he experienced spiritual defeat because of destruction he caused. So in order for us to have joy in the midst of our earthly responsibilities, Christ has to be the master of everything we do. Matthew 6 and 33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, whatever these things are, will be given to you as well. But instead of seeking the kingdom, often we seek what others have. You know the saying, the grass always looks greener on the other side. But that's probably because there's someone on the other side who's committed to tending that grass. And so instead of us tending our own grass, we're constantly comparing what we have with what others have. And ultimately, we miss the joy that the word, the word has promised us. Do you remember the story between the town mouse and the country mouse? The town mouse visited a relative who lived in the country. 
And while the town mouse was there, the country mouse served lunch. And it was wheat socks and boots and acorns, and it gave him a little bit of water to drink. The town mouse ate just a small amount. He nibbled on a little bit of this, he nibbled on a little bit of that, because the food was very simple, and he only wanted to be polite. And after they finished dinner, town mouse talked about her life in the city while the country mouse listened. And then they went to bed that night and they slept in quiet and comfort. And during the night, the country mouse dreamed that she was a town mouse with all the luxuries and delights of the city. So the next day, when the town mouse said to the country mouse, will you come home with me to the city? Of course, she said yes. And when they reached the mansion where the town mouse lived, there were leftovers from a fine banquet. There were sweets and jellies and pastries and cheeses and it was everything that Country Mouse could have imagined. But just as Country Mouse was about to nibble on a pastry, he heard she heard a cat meow loudly. And there was a scratch at the door. And the mouse, the mice scurried to a hiding place where they lay still for a really long time, hardly daring to move or eat. And finally they were able to go back to their feast. And all of a sudden, the door opened, and in came the homeowners to clear the table, followed by the house dog. Country Mouse had had enough. She went to the room, she picked up her bag and her umbrella, and she said to Town Mouse, you may have luxuries and fine food that I don't have, as she said as she hurried away, but I prefer my plain food and simple life in the country with the peace and security that go with it. We have to be like that when we're tempted to exchange the life we find in Christ for earthly, earthly pleasures. We have to say to ourselves that I prefer a life in Christ for the peace, the joy, and the security over anything this earth has to offer. We have to realize that all the things that the country mouse talked about and dreamed about are not where we find our joy. And we also have to realize that the things that the town mouse had came with its own set of unique problems. So how can we find this joy in living that the Bible talks about? Well, Jesus encourages the disciples to remain in him, and that's how we find joy in living. He says, I told you this so that my joy may be in you and that joy may be complete. So the first point is there is joy in glorifying God. God is the master of all that we do, and he is the one that we seek to please. Our scripture says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. For a believer, this life is not about self-promotion. Everything we do should be on pleasing God and not pleasing ourselves. And Paul talks about some aspect of Christian living if you look at verses 18 and 22 of Colossians, the third chapter of Colossians. He doesn't give us this exhausting list of things we should do. And that's because our relationship with Christ is not about this, uh, a bunch of rules. There are not enough rules to cover every situation that we encounter. So what Paul tells us that we have to do is submit to God in whatever we think or do. It's about following Christ in every aspect of our lives. Everything we think or do ought to be compatible with the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to do it in a way that brings glory to his name. And to glorify God is to highlight his grace and his truth and his goodness and his mercy and his justice and his knowledge and his power. First Corinthians 10 and 31 says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I know what you're thinking. That's a really high standard. It is. And it's a challenge for all of us. That means our morning begins with Jesus and ends with him. That means we invoke his name in every situation. We pray for his direction and support in everything. That means every action, every word, every thought, every place, every circumstance. Doesn't matter if we're working, if we're caring for others, if we're shopping for groceries, cleaning the yard. If we do it for God's glory, we increase our treasure in heaven and our joy here on earth. We even serve God in our marriages, in our parenting, and in our professional lives and in our recreational lives. 
Queen Elizabeth called upon a well-known merchant and asked him to handle some important business for her on another continent. And the merchant told the queen, he said, he says, if I go abroad on your business, then my own business at home will suffer. And Queen Elizabeth replied, if you attend to my business, then I shall see to it that your business suffers no loss. That's Christ's approach to us, right? When we work to his glory, we don't suffer a loss. When we work for our own glory, we count it all a loss. Matthew 6 says, do not store up for our, yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. If we do everything in the name of the Lord, that means we have the purest motive. That means we recognize Christ in everything. We have absolute dependence on him at all times, and we have supreme devotion to him. The name of Christ is the greatest power in the universe. And we should at all times be asking ourselves, what would Christ have done in these circumstances? You know, it's a story of a young boy who knew that he had to help his widowed mother make ends meet. So he went out and he looked for work on summer vacation and on Saturdays and on holidays and any other time he didn't have school. So for a while, he worked for a shoemaker named Dan Mackay. Dan was a Christian. And his shoe shop was literally a testimony for Christ in the neighborhood. The walls were covered with uh, Bible texts and pictures, and there was John 3.16 and John 5.24 and Romans 10 and 9 and many more. And everywhere you looked in his shop, the word of God was staring you in the face. And on a little, a little counter in front of the bench where he worked was a Bible. It was generally open, and there were some gospel tracts there. And at every opportunity, Dan uh, kindly and tactfully spoke to his customers about the importance of being born again and a joy in the joy in knowing that your soul has been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And a lot of people came back and asked for more literature and asked how they could find the peace and joy that Dan enjoyed. And the result was that men and women were saved frequently right there in his little shoe shop. It was the little boy's responsibility to pound the leather for the shoes. He'd cut a piece of cowhide and he'd soak it in water. Then he'd place it over a piece of iron over his knees and then he'd take a hammer and he'd pound the soles until they were hard and dry. It was a difficult task and it was tiring and it seemed in endless. But there was another shop across the street from Dan's shop and it was where young men gathered. The shop owner told inappropriate jokes and stories, and the boys could often be ha uh, heard laughing out loud, and it was the kind of place that parents told the kids, you stay away from that place. But the boy noticed that the shop thrived. He also noticed that the shop owner never pounded the soles of the shoes. He, he noticed that the shop owner took the soles out of the water, nailed them on, damp as they were, and with the water splashing from them as he drove each nail. So one day the boy went over and he asked, he said, I noticed you put the soles on while they're still wet. The shop owner looked at him and laughed and said, putting them on wet helps them come back my way just a little bit quicker. And feeling like he learned something, the boy went back and shared it with Dan what the other shop owner had said and suggested that they were wasting time drying out the leather so carefully. Dan stopped his work, opened his Bible to the passage that read, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And Dan told the boy, I don't make or repair shoes just for the money that I get from my customers. I'm doing it for the glory of God. I expect to see every shoe I've ever repaired in a big pile at the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't want the Lord to say to me in that day, Dan, this was a poor job. You didn't do your best here. I want him to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And Dan went on to explain that just as some men were called to preach, he was called to fix shoes. And he told the boy, only if he repaired shoes well could his testimony count for God. 
Only if he repay and choose for the glory of God would his testimony count. You know, like Dan Mackay, everything Jesus did was for the glory of God. And if you go to John 17, the 17th chapter, the fourth verse, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. He said, I spelled out your character in detail to the men and women you gave to me. I gave them the message that you gave me. I guarded them and I protected them so that his joy could be complete. And Jesus' joy was doing the work that he was called to do. It was fulfilling his earthly purpose. And when we can bring glory to God's name, we find joy in living just as Jesus did. The second point is, all of our work should be done unto the Lord. So whatever you do, our second scripture says, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. For a vast portion of the workforce, the best reason we can come up with for going to the job each day is this little jingle I know all of you have heard. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. <laughs> According to a poll, only 43% of American office workers are satisfied with their job or, or are enthusiastic about their work. But Paul gives us a way to grasp a, a glimpse of glory amid the daily grind. He takes us to Titus, the second chapter, in the 10th verse, and it says, Adorn the doctrine of God to show the beauty of our faith in Christ by how we work. Everything a Christian does should be sacred because it should have holiness unto the Lord written all over it. That means we serve the Lord in our everyday tasks. Martin Luther understood this when he wrote, the woman who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as the monk who prays. Not because she may sing a hymn as she sweeps, but because God loves clean floors. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. For the sake of the Lord, we are called to go about our work with all our hearts. It's an issue of character and of fear of the Lord. It's ultimately, it's not ultimately the boss for whom we work, but for God himself. And so whether we're working for a boss or a client or a customer or members of our families in our own home or even our church family, the very act of working is except itself an act of worship to the Lord. He created us in his image and his likeness, and he called us, among other things, to be productive. And it glorifies God when we work for his sake to the best of our ability. And he's going to come back, and we talked about it last week, and demand an account of our service. You've heard that if anything is worth doing, it's worth doing right. And that's a godly principle. Christians should seek to live a life where not one minute or one ounce of energy is wasted. How many times, we've all done it, have you been making or preparing something and you couldn't quite get it right, and you say to yourself, don't worry about it. Nobody will see it. God will see it. You know, Joyce Myers had this example about going to the supermarket. And she said that God impressed upon her heart that there was a right way to go about it. And so she asked the question, how do you handle the grocery cart? You take the cart, you fill it with your groceries, you take it to the cashier and you pay for them. You exit the store and you push the cart to your car. You empty your groceries. Then, what do you do? Do you push the cart between the cars or just push it to the side? Or do you put it in the cart stall? What about when you remove something from a shelf in the store and you decide not to buy it. Do you just put it on the shelf wherever you are? Or do you take it back to where you got it from? I'll admit I'm challenged. I know my husband is saying, I can't believe she's saying that because I'm challenged. When I heard Joyce Myers say it, I just wanted to stomp my feet because I knew she was right. 
I didn't want it to be, but she was right. How we eat, handle even the shopping cart in the parking lot is about working at it with all our heart to our glory. I'm challenged on the days when it's raining or it's snoring on whether I put the basket into the cart stall. But we don't put it into the cart stall because somebody else will have to come and get it if we don't. And we don't put it back on the right place on the shelf because someone else will have to do it if we don't. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And I often hear people say today, I can do whatever I want. And they're right. They're, they can. It's called the believer's freedom. But there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 that says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Yes, we can do whatever we want. We can leave the cart between the cars. But how does it impact your witness that you are a believer? Is it what Jesus would do? Does it bring glory to God? Remember, we're not working for human masters. We're working for the Lord. So we are working for and representing God in all that we do, and we are to do it with a good heart. We are to do it enthusiastically. Don't laugh, but plunge into that task. Don't drag, but dive into our responsibility. Don't moan and groan like I do when you have to take the shopping cart back. But give full devotion to every job. Keep in mind, God and his ways are the, as are the prime motivation for the work that we'll do. And help us do our work as working for the Lord. And the last point, we find real joy in sharing the gospel. We find real joy in living when we acknowledge and tell of God's works in our lives. When we tell others how he has saved us from our sins. When we talk about the marvelous works that he does in our hearts and minds every day. When we talk about his daily saving grace and the Holy Spirit that pushes us towards spiritual maturity. We talk when, when we find real joy, when we talk about how we can't do it alone, but with Christ, all things are possible, and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we can find real joy in living when we tell others about God's holiness, his faithfulness, his mercy, his grace, his love, his majesty, and his power. And that's where we start to find real joy. And as I close, I just want to say that one day, our voice here on earth will be silenced. And in those last moments, I imagine we'll review what we've shared. And we'll want our words to have a sweet echo in the lives of others when we're no longer here. And it's my hope as I know it is yours, that I've shared words that have blessed and not cursed others. Words that have helped and not hindered. Words that have encouraged and not discouraged. Words that have hardened and not disheartened. And words that have increased and not diminished men's value and faith in man and in God. And words that have brightened and not dimmed man's hope for life here and glory after. Psalms 143, 141 and 3 says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. That means make sure that I share the joy that I found in living for Christ with those around me, and in particular with those who do not know him. If there's someone here today who don't know Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, this is another opportunity for each of us to share with you the qualities of Jesus Christ and the benefits of being saved. So if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, now is the time to get out of your seat and walk down the aisle and ask uh, Jesus to be the Lord of your life.
Amen.